Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Slightly Scientific Podcast. I'm Oliver, as always, and I just wanted to extend my thanks and gratitude to everyone who listens to this show. We are a couple weeks away from our two-year anniversary, and it has been a crazy roller coaster. from learning how to work a microphone to still figuring out how to effectively plan an interview, finding people researching and editing. Thank you so much for sticking with us, and I hope you can see an improvement from podcast to podcast. Today, we are going to be putting our lab coats on and getting our magnifying glasses out, because we are delving into the world of forensics. I am so pleased to introduce you today a very special guest who has 20 years of experience in her field, was once a crime scene investigator, and now is lecturing at the University of Wolverhampton, Miss Becky Flanagan. Before we start, I just want to let you know, um, we had some trouble with the audio, but I did try my best, and I hope that you will bear with us, because Becky's story is fascinating, and I'm sure you will want to hear all of her amazing experiences. But for now, it's time for the interview. So, Becky, how did you become a forensic scientist? Okay, uh, where do I start? Um, (laughs) So, um, I uh, have started life as a forensic scientist and crime scene investigator. Um, I first worked after graduating from the university, having studied medical uh, science. Um, I worked at Forensic Science Service undertaking uh, casework DNA analysis and genotyping for criminal cases. Um, got a bit of a, a itchy feet after a few years and uh, um, moved, uh, wanted to move out of the laboratory and into sort of operational crime scene examination. Um, and I was lucky enough to get my sort of dream job as a CSI, um, probably about 20 years ago now. Um, and sort of since then, I've had a career of 20 years with the police, um, primarily working as a crime scene investigator, but then progressing to working as a crime scene manager and crime scene coordinator with West Midlands Police. Um, and that role really involved the managing and coordinating the forensic response to uh, major incidents and murders within the region. So quite a sort of big responsibility, coordinating other CSIs and other specialists um, and liaising with the senior investigating officer to make sure we uh, um, provided that quality response and maximised evidence opportunities, really. Um, I sort of I was doing that for probably about 10 years and then I sort of ventured into leadership, hoping to influence um, how we did things in crime scene investigation, um, but also uh, worked with a number of other teams to sort of increase my specialist knowledge, um, working with the fingerprint development laboratory, where they enhance uh, fingerprints with um, chemicals and specialist light sources, um, the footwear team, and uh, then back to CSI again, where I became team leader of the CSI team, with four to six CSIs uh, working in the Midlands region. Um, and uh, yeah, just it was a really great to sort of, you know, help support them with the resources they needed to do their job. Um, but a lot of that also involved um, quality accreditation as well, which means making sure we are doing um, the same process for each job, no matter who gets sent to it, and to make sure there's quality standards for their criminal justice system. Um, but yeah, in the last, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, in the last couple of years, I've uh, moved into academia. So I'm now back, um, back at university again. Um, but this time I'm teaching and lecturing in forensic science. I hope to pass on all my knowledge and experience to our future generations. Wow, that, that's fantastic. I mean, it seems like you've kind of done everything any forensic scientist has ever done in like any superhero movie. So, you know, that's pretty cool. Like, <laughs> not, not quite. There's, <laughs> there's quite a few other specialisms out there, but as you sort of mentioned, it's, it's such a broad forensic science. is so huge. There's so many specialisms in different areas of science involved in, in the one discipline. So it's all very exciting. Wow, yeah. And and um, I couldn't help but notice you said, um, you know, CSI being a crime scene investigator was your dream job. What made you um, what made you decide that, you know, you wanted to become, you know, crime scene investigator? Ah, oh, very good question. <laughs> I think it, it's just I think it stemmed from my my love of maths and science, which sounds very, very geeky, but absolutely love maths and science at school. But then also always thought about having a job that was sort of helping people and, you know, doing the right thing and within society, trying to do a good job somewhere. And so my level of things, science uh, led to math, biology, chemistry level. Um, but like any sort of teenager, I didn't, wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do in my life, what careers were out there. Um, but the science led to more science at the university, as I mentioned, studying medical science. 
Um, and that was really varied, really applied science support with practical applications. And that's when I sort of love of science became science to help people. Um, and I was really lucky, so shortly after graduating university and sending out many, many CVs, that's when I landed the job as the forensic scientist uh, with forensic science service. But that was really, that was a really useful job because it gave me the experience and the knowledge of the criminal justice system to then, um, you know, jump into crime scene investigation. But I think at the time it was when um, I think the CSI programmes were very sort of starting up and they were all over the telly and CSI was very exciting. But for me, it was, all, you know, what's the science behind it? How, how are they doing things? What's the reality? And that's why I sort of became interested in that sort of science. It's yes, yeah, so it's really exciting. Every day is different. You know, a major part of the CSI role that we don't really get taught is to sort of provide that reassurance to them when you know they've had something you know really terrible happen to them, and uh, try and sort of help help them feel better, and take the time out to speak to them, speak to them, have a chat, and offer sort of crime prevention advice, and that's sort of quite the quite rewarding as well. So, if you're into kind of applied sciences, forensics is maybe for you. But first, I had to ask Becky one very important question. What is the weirdest or most unusual crime you have ever investigated? Now, funnily enough, I get asked this quite a lot, actually. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Um, So you're not the first person to ask this question. Um, I I do have one, so I had been thinking about this. Um, But, um, you know, there are some that I've had, I probably can't really talk about because just some of the nature of them um and I know of colleagues who have had some very strange very strange ones um uh, again they're quite gory so again I'm, I'm, I'm going for the the uh, um PG rated versions uh, but, right, yeah. but um, <laughs> Thank you. however saying that um probably the strangest one um I've had um was a um a chap who left work um you know, CCTV, I've been leaving work and then just disappeared. Um, so it was down as a missing person. His family had reported him missing. Um, you know, no indication of where he was gone or who he was going to see. Um, and then he was later found the next day um, in his own car, in the boot, in a television box that had been taped up and tied up with rope. And we were like, he's in his own car. <laughs> You know, and he's not far from where he left work. And how, how has he got here? You know, is it? You know, he's not. You know, you start thinking, could is it a suicide? Could they have got themselves in that position? You start thinking, actually, you know, you start thinking yourself practically. How would that? How would that work? And it, you know, we started, um, you know, thinking about it, and we're like, no, it's not Houdini. This this guy's. Um, there's definitely somebody else involved here. Um, and uh. It was just a, a very surreal case because it was saying we just couldn't pin down who was involved. Just police officers started checking CCTV, um, sort of in the immediate area, and there was nothing, nothing there. So it was one of those ones that really did boil down to forensics. So it was also the case of we do we examine him here and get him out of the car, but unfortunately, there's, it was on a residential road, so there's lots of people around. So that was an idea. So we just loaded up the whole car onto a recovery truck and took it back to one of our friends at garages with the guys still inside so that at least when we went to process the body we could do it in a bit more of a controlled environment without um sort of people people looking on but again it's a sort of forensic strategy test because you know you want to examine the body but you don't want to um, ruin any forensic evidence on the outside so we were not specialists with how the knots were tied we were consulting with um Specialists are like looking at the tape, had it been bitten or had it been cut, were the fibers of DNA on the tape and the rope. And there was a very unusual one. We sort of had sequentially sort of removed that from around um from around him. He'd been um his hood had been they had a hoodie on and been pulled really, really tightly so you couldn't see his face. And they're like, that's also quite unusual. And that sort of led me to start thinking, um, is it someone that knows him? Because they don't want to see his face and sort of you know, feel the guilt associated with that. Um, and it it was just a yeah, very strange case. And we um, it transpired us, the police officers were sort of doing their investigation inquiries. Again, the brilliance of mobile phones and CCTV um, came back and I was looking at his phone, but there was a number he was contacting. Um, and it turned out that he'd had a um, female friend, she would say, and um, had been um, visiting her um, and knew about. And um, he 
then Lizzie and Mary tried to break it off with her and um, she'd obviously not been very happy about that and had um, colluded with her estranged husband to invite him over, the, the victim over, and then put him in the house. Um, so the CCTV that shows this, that we ended up finding out where this woman lived, and you see the neighbours had CCTV, and you see the victim walk into the house from his car, and you don't see him out to him. Um, so you then see a, um, a, a, a couple of men picking up this TV box that looks a very misshapen TV and put it into the car, and then that's the sort of the last time you've sort of seen the victim. Um, so it was very, very strange. Um, but again, those, um, their children of this uh, offender and her strange husband um, tried to provide alibis, saying, oh, no, they were at home eating, when in fact their mobile phone showed them in the vicinity of uh, where he'd been killed. So it's a really sad case in a way because he went into that house and we'll actually never know what happened in there because the offenders didn't talk, didn't tell the story. Um, but we know he went in and didn't come out alive and ended up in his own car. So it was, it was kind of just like a bit of a mystery to start off with. And we're like, how has this happened? And it, you know, you have no, no offenders, no, no leads. And it was boiling down to forensic evidence. But fortunately, um, as well, the forensic evidence came good because we got um, DNA profiles on the uh, tape that ran box and on the rope. And also we DNA swabbed the toggle where the, of, of, and the string where the hoodie had been pulled. And we got a DNA profile of that for the male offender in, in, the, in the crime. So um, it actually features on a Netflix um, documentary as well. I'm not sure what the age is on it is, but yeah, it's on a, a Netflix documentary called uh, My Love and My Killer. Um, so it's again, it's sort of an interesting, um, interesting one. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's um, you know, it's again a really horrific, horrific case to sort of deal with, but um, it's just like sort of this mystery. <laughs> We couldn't figure out what had happened and how it happened and who been involved for ages. So, um, but yeah, forensic evidence and digital evidence came good. Yeah, it's, uh, it sounds like it belongs in like a Netflix documentary. You know, person walks into the house, yeah. doesn't come out. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely yeah. have a look at it. What did you say it was called again? What? Uh, um, my love and my killer. My love and my killer. <laughs> Episode one. But, um, I, you might edit this out, but it was quite interesting. If I didn't know it's gone on there. And I, I was because I'm a bit geeky. I watch lots of friends at CSI programs, and I went on to watch that. Like, That's my case. <laughs> Where's that come from? <laughs> so, and um, the guy on there's the SIO, Paul Joyce, who's the um, is an extra. <laughs> it is. It sounds like that sometimes. It's like. Um, yeah, I suppose they base. I suppose uh, you know they must base some movies and things on on scenarios that happen. And, you know, spurned spurned lover and all that. So, but anyway, they're in job. <laughs> I've just got one more kind of out there question, and it and it's this. So I've um, recently been reading, you know, a book, As Good as Dead by Holly Jackson. If anyone is interested, um, where this protagonist. She plants um, DNA to frame someone else for a crime. <laughs> now, would this be possible? And also this kind of ties into like another question. As a forensic, as a, well, as a crime scene investigator and as a forensic scientist, how do you separate kind of that one fingerprint you want from all the other fingerprints that you don't? So all the other kind of noise in the area. So I'll, I'll ask the first part first. So, um, yeah. Um, it is, you could, uh, an offender could plant um, DNA evidence rather of a crime scene, um, but we would treat, you know, all evidential um, recoveries that we find, we would treat them in the same way, because obviously we don't know planted at the same time, so they're given all due, due investigation and exam examination. Um, it is, it's more difficult to plant evidence such as compact DNA, so your cellular DNA and um, your, you know, your blood as a direct transfer to a scene is very difficult to plant because it comes from directly from that person. However, there's sort of an intermediary in, in, in that. So they've touched or drunk from a can and the can's been poked up and put at the crime scene. Um, that's how, you know, that could be transferred and put at the crime scene. Um, however, as I say, we would cover all our evidence and treat it with the same, you know, the same processes as, as we would. Um, so we say, for example, that can we would still submit for fingerprint DNA swabbing. It might well identify somebody. 
then it's down to actually the investigation team to either prove or disprove that person's involvement. Um, so they do that by um, basically they'll interview them, find out um, where they were at the time of the events, whether they are known to that person. Um, have they got a have they got an alibi? Were they somewhere else uh, at that time? Does their mobile phone show them somewhere else at that time? CCTV or a reliable witness? You know, um, and they go through that process of elimination. You effectively have a hypothesis of that person being involved, and you go down each uh, inquiry avenue and you prove or eliminate that particular hypothesis of them being involved. Um, it has happened. It doesn't happen often that we have these plants the evidence. Um, but it has happened at a murder. Um, it wasn't, wasn't a murder I dealt with, but I was in Flanagan at the time, and one of my team dealt with it. And it was a really tragic, and you know, all these uh, very tragic incidents, um, and it's a really tragic incident where an unknown offender broke into a female's house, um, sexually assaulted and murdered the victim. And the offender had attempted to plant um, cigarettes in the house. Um, I... I'm not 100% sure where he got them from, possibly just even out in the street um, as a potential, um, you know, planting someone else's DNA there to put them in the picture for the murder. Um, and that DNA was was recovered um, as normal, as a potential evidence piece. And the DNA matched the man who did live in the area who was on record, but the due diligence of the investigation, um, you know, they, they considered the of the item had it been was it a flattened cigarette that could have trodden on and walked in or was it still sort of rounded as if someone had dropped it uh, you know and just dropped it there and there so you know a cigarette that's just uh, still maintained its shape is quite likely to have been left there by that person um but they spoke to this man he did live in the area um but he had witnesses and he had an alibi which was corroborated by his mobile phone so he was then eliminated from the inquiry and we did, um, there was enough forensic evidence for the actual offender at the window where he climbed in um, that helped sort of um, uh, prove, and also, and also um, uh, probably foods as well, that helped prove him being directly involved. So we, we have had that occasion of it. Um, the second part, the fingerprints. My fingerprints, it is unfortunately, you recover everything. <laughs> um, so if you're not sure, um, it, for a burglary scene, if you think they've, they've climbed into the window, the window's been torn, you know they've climbed into that area and they've handled a jewellery box um, or picked something up and you know they've touched those areas, those tend to be the areas that you will examine. And then if you, if you find in that area, you will recover. Um, you wouldn't necessarily think of the whole house for a burglary, you would literally target um, areas where you know there has been disturbance or something moved. Um, so there's sort of element of proportionality to it. We haven't looked the resources, so we will just target those areas. Um, however, if it's murder and you've got an unknown defender um, in a house, you can get it. <laughs> we will literally think of any surface that's been printable, um, be that with like, print powders, or we'll get specialist um, scientists come down who will do chemical treatments to enhance fingerprints on um, sort of more rough uh, surfaces or pieces of blood. And it's a case that we submit the whole lot to the fingerprint bureau and remember it afterwards. And um, uh, they will check all those marks. So first we do an elimination procedure. So they will uh, make sure we have fingerprint sets from victims, uh, from police officers, from anyone else who's been at that scene. And they'll do that elimination procedure to eliminate those, those fingerprints out to be left with unknown fingerprints. And they'll try and do as much elimination as possible. If, there's, uh, if it's a shared house and there's multiple documents, try and get fingerprints of those other offers and make sure that we can be there and we'll eliminate those out and hopefully leave um, if any fingerprints behind in theory. Um, however, fingerprints can last on a surface indefinitely. Um, there's no time limit for fingerprints. So um, and then it comes to get fingerprint identifications. We again have to do that elimination and um, inquiries for the investigation and to try and, you know, bring it down to what's um, but, uh, but we do sometimes have cases where there are uh, fingerprints um, that hopefully do identify the offender as well. So it's a kind of it's a, a very big, um, big sort of process of lots of different parts all interacting with each other um, in terms of proving, disproving um, a hypothesis or the lines of inquiry. So um, yeah, sometimes it can be can be a big job. Murders can sometimes take days and up, or up to a couple of years. Is it ever like, um, I've read loads of kind of um, murder mystery, like novels and everything. Oh, 
We get it, Pastor Ollie. We know you like a good murder mystery storyline. Is it ever is it ever like that kind of the way you solve a case? Um, sometimes we do. <laughs> um, we, we do um, watch a lot of <laughs> crime scene uh, programs, murders and things like on the telly, and we're like, wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do it like that. That's, that's not realistic. <laughs> but then we do um, watch um, quite a lot of documentaries on Netflix and on BBC iPlayer. It's actually a real CSI uh, program on there. Yes, yeah. Yeah, if you've seen it, yeah. Um, that's, um, I was sort of managing this with some of my colleagues. And, you know, that's that's kind of actually the reality of it. Um, you know, we are, you know, not everything is so immediate. You know, it does take time to do scientific analysis when we spend quite a bit of evidence off. Um, and to do an investigation really, really thoroughly, it has to be done so step by step, so meticulously. Um, and just, you know, make sure you're covering each base and doing your sequential evidence uh, recovery in the right order. Um, so, it, you, know, there, you know, the principles are the same on the telly, you know, DNA analysis and fingerprinting, but um, uh, sometimes it's not quite um, done in a realistic manner, shall we say. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. So that is Forensics, the real CSI, which you can find on BBC iPlayer. But for now, it's time for Crime Scene Questions. Spoiler, I had quite a few. Uh, yeah, and, um, but if we go and talk about, you know, kind of um, crime scenes, you know, at what point would you be called to one? Um, and what would be your job there? Okay, so it depends on the incident, really. So um, if it's what we call volume crime, um, which is, or, or property crime, as it's known. So that's your um, your burglaries, your vehicle crime, your criminal damage. So I did actually look this up, and according to the South York's police website, volume crime is any crime which, through its sheer volume, has a significant impact on the community and the ability of the local police to tackle it. So if it's volume crime, they'll see who's closest um, and make sure that they are able to attend with their workload, uh, which Western police always try to attend within 24 hours of the uh, case landing with our CSI casting team, because sometimes you can't always get access and it might be at work or, uh, you know, a sort of uh, number of other reasons. Um, however, if it's a uh, major crime or serious crime, anything to do with violence or sexual offences, um, we always work to the golden hour. So we always uh, try and make contact um, with either senior investigating officer to basically have that initial briefing and discussion of uh, what we're going to do when we attend scene. Um, it's not always attendance because we may not have all the information. Um, as long as that scene's preserved, we can keep it and no evidence will be lost. Um, but it might be we need more information and more intelligence to be able to go in and target our examination to prioritise things that are going to identify offenders and uh, potentially um, provide, uh, you know, uh, build the case uh, uh, for them. So, um, yeah, it's we try and we try and go within that hour. But basically, our first responsibility is when we do get there is gathering information, really important, making sure we know as much as we can before we go into the scene. Um, be that from uh, say the burglary, speak to the victim of crime, find out what happened and they left the house. And then for a sort of major serious crime, that would be yeah, speaking to witnesses, getting as much information from the first attending officer as possible. And then it's all about preserving the scene as well, making sure that we're um, we're not going to lose any evidence due to weather or people trampling over it. So we put up cordons, uh, so people might see the blue and white police tape. They use police tape. Going to be honest, I thought they only had that in movies. Around, floating around on, on the various places, and that just basically is a barrier to stop members of the public walking into our scene and trampling on potential evidence or, you know, um, things from evidence or the threat that something might be recovery. Um, and it just restricts that access. And um, we'll always have a police officer who will secure the scene for us. Um, because the majority of the CSIs around the country actually are civilian staff and not police officers. Um, so they provide that security for us. Um, we would also establish a common approach path, so to make sure our entry into the scene is the same way each time, and that path is cleared of any, to make sure there's nothing there that we trample on, so we can um, uh, enter and exit the scene um, without disturbing anything. And yeah, and just general crime scene preservation, it's an outdoor scene, you get to scene 10, so we'll, we'll improvise and put a dustbin lid over something to try and preserve it. Um, obviously, if we've got an indoor scene, everything's preserved uh, nicely for us. So, 
you know, we, we get fifty six a bit of time to yeah, get that information and come up with our forensic strategy of how we're going to process that scene. And you talked about the kind of police tape mm-hmm. as well. Is it, you know, I, I was actually going to ask, like, what do, what do crime scenes look like? Do they just look kind of how, do they look normal? Like just normal place, there's not really much going on or I'm assuming it varies a lot depending on the... Yeah, you know. I mean, absolutely. I mean, as I said, every day, every job, it's the same crime time, every job is different. So, it, I mean, a crime scene can be anything. It can be a location, it can be a house, it can be a vehicle. Um, we also sometimes refer to people's crime scenes, so the victim might have evidence on them that they need to recover, or the suspect might have evidence on them that they need to recover. So it depends on the circumstance. Um, with a burglary, commonly a house or a business where there may be some uh, you know, clothes pulled out of the drawer as they've been searching or things pulled out of cupboards. There might be a broken window when they try to get in, or some damage to the door where they try to get in. Um, so that's the sort of common common crimes and there might be a bit mess um but yeah as I say especially in, in West Midlands um where I was based it's you know we've got um, quite poor and deprived areas um then we have quite um sort of richer areas so it just and you know nobody is sort of exempt from being you know a victim of crime unfortunately you know, some, some are targeted and some are random so yeah we see we all see all sorts of people and all sorts of places <laughs> so very interesting job right yeah and um what kind of evidence do you collect at these crime scenes? How much information, I guess, can you just gather from a crime scene? Because it doesn't seem like that'd be that much to, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but again, it's very dependent on the circumstances, but your main, you sort of mentioned your main sort of four, four or five types you'll look for as a standard, so it will be your DNA evidence. Um, that can be anything in the form of um, blood from the victim or um, an injury to the offender, um, any drinking saliva on drinks cans and drinking vessels or even touching a door handle and then yes fingerprints you know whatever and the principle I will I will uh, um, give you the principle which is low cost principle which is every contact needs a trace so there's always going to be some trace of you somewhere on a murder weapon or on a door or on a person so with fingerprints if they've touched anything and they're not wearing gloves it's, uh, it's all reactive fine their fingerprints may be left on again sort of doors jewelry boxes that they've searched through a piggy bank that they've emptied out or a glass they've drunk from and um, you know anything that looks moved or out of place um and it's not the norm we would examine the chance that we might find um and of things on there and again with, with footwear footwear is actually quite a good one because although it's not a sort of personal identifier so dna and fingerprints are on, on the person footwear is actually a removable item um, again, you can't float into a crime scene. People have to walk in. <laughs> so, um, and they don't think very often, or people don't think very often about covering their feet. They will leave a latent mark, hopefully, um, which we can then powder up with uh, our fingerprint pads, use the same, and uh, potentially lift. You know, those are the main types we look for. But there's so many other things. We look at um, fibres and the fibre transfer between clothing. Um, and what's more and more prevalent in this position is um, digital evidence. So um, with the advent of social media and you know, everything that is online and digital now, digital evidence has really, really taken over um, as being a major, major forensic evidence target of crime scene. Um, mobile phone data, um, all that data you think needs to be deleted might still be there in somewhere. Um, and they can also do track phone our phone uh, triangulation and tracking. So things like mobile phones, computers, CCTV, um, especially in a very urban area like London um, or Birmingham, CCTV everywhere, and this sort of tracks we can do. That really, you know, an example of a really sad and tragic um, murder for Everard where um, CCTV helped um, catch the killer. So it's, it's so much evidence out there that, you know, it's just um, thinking what's relevant to that particular scene. And uh, that's where you come up with your forensic strategy. You have a look at your scene. See what you've got, where to potentially have to start and document it down, then go in and start um, examining those examinations will bring you in terms of results. I mean, it's weirdly crazy and cool how much information you can gather about someone. But I guess I guess we should move on. Um mm-hmm. so um kind of reading your email that you um sent us, um you said that you were like involved in the tragic fatal road traffic collision during the 2011 national riots. And um, you, yeah. yeah, you said this case was particularly challenging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, 
yeah, it, it definitely was. I think it's one of the, I wouldn't say highlights, I'd say it's, it's definitely a um, a time uh, remembered in my career. Um, so uh, I've had a career telling sort of 20 years in late, and um, this is one that's always stuck, stuck in my mind. Really. And I think um, as I sort of talk to you through it, it'll probably sort of explain why really. Um, just to give them a bit of background for, for those um, who are not aware of the riots in 2011, um, it was a really high profile um, incident on a huge scale. Um, it started with a shooting of a man in London and a uh, protest escalated into riots across London and then across the other cities in the UK. And um, basically, there were businesses and buildings um, being ransacked, being robbed, set on fire, lots of altercations within the um, community. Uh, two different cultures and the police. Um, and it was it was quite a scary time, I think. Um, I, I know I definitely felt pretty pretty unnerved by it. Um, but in this particular case, um, during this time, there was uh, lots of people on, uh, on the streets of Birmingham and their view was to protect their properties and business from being burgled and ransacked or damaged. Um, and there was uh, a number of people, big groups of people in the community out on the streets at night time to protect those people. And um, uh, two vehicles that drove directly into the crowd at the speed, and they basically uh, fatally injured men. Um, so it's absolutely horrific, horrific incident that happened. But the real challenge was that the riots were still continuing during that time. There was uh, right police and gangs approaching the scene where we were working less than, uh, less than half a mile away. Um, we do get pulled out in the night for major, major crimes, so we were working sort of partly in the night and through the day. Um, and there was real operational strategic challenges for the case for the team at the scene, um, as we had a really big scene um, because it was a vehicle hitting hitting some people, and there was loads of people around at the time, and we didn't know who was involved. Um, we needed to identify witnesses um, from evidence at the scene, and um, there was a huge amount of work to do all this time, knowing that when night time came. Rights of escalate, um, as you know, this is really tragic, absolutely really added to, to tensions as well. Um, so there was some real pressure on myself and the team. I was crime scene managing for the day to the team. And I was really lucky, I had really great people working with me, worked really hard, um, and we just made sure that we methodically just went through the scene, recovering evidence as expeditiously and effectively as we could to try and get that scene processed um, because we knew we would be able to hold and preserve that scene overnight. Um, especially because of the riots, there's a real drain on uh, these resources to sort of, you know, preserve all uh, things like that. So um, there was no, obviously no victim account, so it's tragically uh, passed away. And we didn't have CCTV available initially, um, so we were just kind of working in the dark with what had happened, um, with some stories from the witnesses, and trying to make sure that we recovered all the evidence that we needed to, and we weren't going to lose anything that might be critical later on before. Um, so, um, it's all mixed some emotions, really, um, because obviously as part of the investigation, when the CCTV is available, um, our CSIs and crime team corners, we do watch the CCTV of incidents as it is, before it'll help us sort of see what's happened and target specific areas that might be, um, might be relevant and might lead us uh, any sort of forensic evidence, um, or items that might help the case. So, um, being at the scene, and then watching what had happened and seeing that um, that impact was really, really emotionally um, challenging for me personally. Um, and that combined with the pressure of making sure you know, you hold your responsibility with your team safety and welfare with the toxins of the gang. And then also it was a time really where forensic staff um, jobs uh, uncertainty, um, with a, uh, that uncertainty due to bug, uh, government budget cuts. So, it was very much you have to just put your personal things aside. And that's how I've always done the job, is to really put those personal emotions to one side and just make sure you focus on the scene you've got and the science um, behind it to make sure you do a really top quality job with your people and their family. That just ends up being the most important thing. But it was just a real sort of real test of my personal resilience, that one as well. I um I hadn't previously imagined just how much mm. emotional stress forensic scientists have to go through. I mean, I can't even imagine mm. what it would be Absolutely, like. Absolutely, yeah. It's very much a, um, with, yes, um, the 
private investigators and coordinators and also the digital forensic um, scientists because of the nature of some of the things they have to look at as well um, in terms of the, um, the type of sort of cyber offences that are now um, now prevalent. Um, it can be, you have to be a certain type of person to be able to do these jobs, I think, and you need to be quite emotionally resilient to not take it home and just focus on the job and the science um, behind it. So it's not all about just being a scientist and being able to do the job and follow a process. You also have to be the right sort of person to, you know, be able to provide that public reassurance for victim of crime and then be able to handle, you know, um, a lot of death and death and destruction, really. So, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine crime scenes also being quite um, dangerous um, for the people investigating them as well. Um, sometimes, but not always. We... Um, it's a very sad, a very boring subject of health and safety. Um, but that's, you know, again, one of the, our initial actions is to undertake a dynamic health and safety risk assessment before and after crime scene. So if we know, get caught in a job and an offender might still be there, we absolutely won't go. Um, if we get caught to a, a, a murder, a serious crime scene, police officers have to be present to provide the security should the offender come back. And they will need to check the house or location to check the offender's not in the vicinity. Um, so we, because we are civilian staff, we do get some personal safety training, um, but um, we um, very much do run that risk assessment, you know, even around biohazards like blood um, and you know, drugs that might be present. We always assess that to make sure that, you know, any um, actions we're taking, there's some control measures in place, even handling knives and you know, making sure we put them in rigid containers and packaging, so, you know, sort of basic things like that. So they, they can be, depending on the scene, but we, as I say, we make sure we're, we're safe first. <laughs> right, yeah. Now, Becky, you've been involved in just so many areas of forensics, like fr- from being on the crime scene to being in the lab, and you're now lecturing at university. What job has been the most challenging for you? And um, which job was the most rewarding? That's a really difficult question, actually, because they each have their own challenges and rewards in different ways. Um, so I suppose as a CSI and as crime scene coordinator, there's always that pressure of the job and when the job comes in and you've got to get the evidence and preserve the scene. And there's like, it's very go, 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 go. There's no sort of rest for that 24 hours. Um, and you've got to try and manage the resources and hope you can get the resources and make sure everything's done properly. So um, that's, you know, you know, immensely challenging. That's probably the most challenging job, I would say, being a CSI coordinator. Um, but the rewards were so great as well when you, you know, successfully identify an offender and they get successfully convicted at court and have like the SIO or the judge say, you know, amazing sort of quality and quantity of forensic evidence and help secure that. And, you know, that's really, really great for me and my team. And, so, you know, it's absolutely a team effort. You know, I have one role, but everyone else has a role to play. It's very much a team effort with specialists in the CSI team as well. Um, being a team leader, <laughs> that had a lot of challenges, a lot of people challenges. Um, but I love people, so you know it's always interesting to work through logically how to solve problems with them, and you know helping someone out when they're struggling or they've got a problem, and then you know they they become able to do their job and they're happy in their work. That's also quite rewarding. Um, but I. And, and the university is great. I mean, I've, I've not been here long. I've been here three months, um, but I am loving it. So I'm loving chatting to the students and telling them all about my experiences. And they're so excited and keen um, and speaking to schools and colleges and, you know, really, you know, telling them the love, love of science and what you can do do with science. But I th- I, I'm going to go back to my CSI roots and say that one was probably the most rewarding and challenging. Um, so, yeah, I, I was year six. I was there for 20 years. Um, but I think it was just time for a change on the past few seasons. So um, I get to relive the experiences of my students. I think that's wonderful, being able to share all your um, funny stories with um, and all your experiences with, all, with your uh, students. Well, thank you so much for giving up your yeah, evening absolutely. to come, come and talk with us. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, it's been an absolute treat for us to, to be able to talk to you about this. Yeah, very welcome. Really enjoyed it. Thank you Thanks for, for listening and for inviting me. Yeah. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. You too, Becky. Cheers. Very Bye. much. I hope you enjoyed this interview and learned a thing or two about forensics. I certainly have. I encourage you to follow Becky. I've put the link to her Twitter in the description. 
And if anyone wants to send me any thoughts or ideas, feel free to contact us at the Slightly Sci. There'll also be a link to our Twitter in the description. Stay tuned for the next episode, but please bear in mind I'm going through GCSE, so I'm not exactly sure when that will be. I'll definitely be tweeting some alerts, though, beforehand. Thank you, everyone, once more. Enjoy the autumn, Halloween, and probably Christmas. Toodaloo.